Welcome back to Winging It with Sandy. I'm Jeffrey Thomas, and I'm joined by my co-host, the lovely Sandy. Hi, Sandy. How are you? I'm great, and thank you for having me again. It's a pleasure. So today, we're going to do a deep dive into turbulence, what it is, how it's changing, and why your bumpy flight probably isn't as dramatic as it feels in the cabin. So let's uh, let's kick this off, Sandy. Yes, so turbulence is definitely one of those things that gets even the calmest flyer a little bit tense. Um, it just messes with your head. One minute you're fine and the next you're clutching the seat thinking how much worse is this actually going to get? Um, I used to think that turbulence meant that something was failing on the plane or that we were dropping out of the sky. But um, after one of our earlier winging episodes um, where we delved into the fear of flying, I, I mentioned that turbulence was um, explained to me using a, an analogy of a jelly bowl. Um, and that really stuck with me. So, so like I, I mentioned in that episode, I said um, it was said to me that you've got to imagine that the plane is like a coin sitting in the middle of a bowl of jelly. If you shake the bowl, the jelly wobbles everywhere, but the coin doesn't fall out. And so that's what they told me that turbulence really is. Um, it's just the air shifting, the plane's moving, but it's not falling. So that mental picture still honestly helps me every single time. Yeah, look, technically speaking, turbulence is simply irregular motion of the air masses. There are several distinct types of turbulence caused by convective turbulence from thunderstorms and rising heat. Uh, mountain wave turbulence where the air flows over terrain and becomes uh, like a, uh, if you can consider the analogy of a rock in a stream, um, where you've got a rock, the, air, the water flows over it and then tumbles, same sort of thing. You've got wake turbulence from other aircraft and clear air turbulence, which is invisible and often occurs near jet streams where a jet stream uh, starts or finishes. Uh, you can get uh, some ruffled air there as well. The most concerning from an operational standpoint is the clear air turbulence. Unlike convective storms, which can be visibly identified and avoided either by sight or on radar, Clear air turbulence can occur unexpectedly in perfectly clear skies at cruising altitudes where aircraft operate most efficiently. Yeah, so that is probably the one that gets me the most as well. It's the it's the sneaky kind because it's not like you can see these clouds bu building and mentally brace for that one. So one minute you're sipping your coffee and the next minute you're wearing it. Um, understanding why it's physically happening, that it's not actually a huge drop, but micro changes in altitude um, has also shifted how I react to it as well. Yeah. So, Sandy, recent studies have shown a 55% increase in severe clear air turbulence over the North Atlantic since 1979. That, inc that increase correlates strongly with the rising global temperatures and changes in the atmospheric wind shear, which affect the strength and, vi and variability of the jet streams. And this trend isn't isolated, unfortunately. Turbulence hotspots are increasing across key flight corridors um, globally, Europe, North America, Asia, and the Middle East. The uh, warming uh, climate is enhancing wind shear gradients at cruising altitudes, which directly increases turbulence intensity and, uh, sadly, frequency. Yeah, and I have 100% noticed that as well. So flights that used to feel smooth um, for years now feel like they've added in bonus bumps just for fun. Um, and when you do break it down like that, that the jet, jet streams are shifting, um, more vari variability in the wind shear and those upper level atmospheric changes, you can really see how these small variations at that cruising altitude end up translating into what we feel as passengers. Um, it's kind of amazing how sensitive the ride can actually feel when you're at that level. Yes, but look, fortunately, there are improvements in atmospheric modelling, satellite data, onboard multi-scan weather radar. And I might mention that multi-scan weather radar only came in uh, 25 years ago. It was pioneered by Qantas in Australia. And uh, just to sort of tell the viewers what multi-scan is, one of the issues, particularly with thunderstorms and particularly at night, is that you can't see them. Um, and the radar can't see it either, 
because it's all ice at that altitude and the radar doesn't read the ice. So what they developed was what we call multi-scan radar, where the radar goes up and down. It goes right down to the surface, then goes back up, down, up. And it reads the uh, intensity of the rainfall at a lower altitude and converts that into a model of the thunderstorm in front of the, uh, the, the aircraft. So these multi-scan radars can see out about 200 uh, kilometers, roughly, and they give the pilots a very good indication of what's ahead. It's not perfect and requires interpretation and settings, but it's been a, a real uh, major advance. And prior to 9-11, I used to spend most of my time in the cockpit of aeroplanes. At night time, I'd see the pilots turning on the landing lights. And I asked them, why are you doing that? And they said, we're looking out for thunderstorms. This is obviously at night. Um, and that's even, you know, in 1999-2000, that's where we were with uh, trying to detect thunderstorms uh, in the middle of the night using landing lights to look for them. So we've certainly come a long way in the last uh, 25 years. Now, airlines are also involved with um, real-time turbulence data and they're sending it through to a global sharing network as well so whenever they encounter turbulence uh, this information is passed on so that other aircraft can um, benefit from the experience of the airplane in front now um, this was this has only become a this has only become a really a recent thing but certainly uh, drastically improving the avoidance of turbulence with more communication between the aircraft themselves I always um I have to picture those pilots up there like they're playing a, a live action video game sometimes just constantly checking that radar chatting to the other planes and trying to dodge those right those rough patches like it's Mario Kart just up at 35,000 feet. Mm. Um it's like getting stuck in potholes that you can't see. Um the plane sensors feel it before we do, but I I do still quite often feel that instant jolt and um just when you think about how the turbulence report feeds into those real-time data networks and how quickly the crews can adjust to the altitude or reroute based on those vertical wind shear layers, it's pretty incredible um, how much they are actually avoiding before we even feel a bump. Yes, and another thing that airlines do, they've got um, control centres at their headquarters, whether it's uh, Sydney or Singapore or well, from different airlines, and they have... Uh, tremendous weather feed information coming in um, and they've got a plot of where all their aircraft are and they're constantly updating uh, their their uh, pilots uh, around the world with the very latest weather suggesting alternatives um, and uh, you know it's it's uh, uh, certainly far more proactive than it used to be so that um, um, pilots can let their passengers and crew know um, and we are in for a few bumps. Um, so, as I mentioned, the pilots do receive turbulence advisories from air traffic control and reports from preceding aircraft known as pilot reports or PREPs. Combined with weather radar, wind shear detectors and new predictive models, uh, we can now anticipate far more than even a few decades ago. Now, before the 1960s, when radar technology was still primitive, turbulence-related injuries and fatalities were far more common. In the 1950s alone, 300 people died in turbulence-related accidents. Today, that figure has been reduced by over 95%, despite the massive increase in global air travel. I mean, the, it's, uh, it's a rarity for someone to lose their life. Certainly people have got injured, but it's very, very rare for anybody to lose their life in a turbulence-related uh, injury. I guess the um, keep your seatbelt on at all times is for a reason for that one, I guess. Um, mm. But it really is kind of incredible. I mean, we always feel like flying's gotten rougher lately, but when you hear it, like that with all these extra flights that are up there now and that the serious incidents have dropped by 95 percent 
um, that's really got to show you how much better this tech and training have have actually made things. And it's um it's a really good reminder that while turbulence might feel dramatic in the cabin, um, statistically, it's actually never been safer. Yes, well, of course, you you can thank social media for that because any any bump in the night becomes a viral post on so on Instagram or Twitter or TikTok or something. So um, yeah. But structurally, modern aircraft are certified to withstand huge stress loads far beyond anything turbulence produces in routine operations. Even severe turbulence rarely approaches an aircraft's design limits. Um, most turbulence injuries today occur because passengers aren't wearing seat belts, not because of any failure of the aircraft itself. And what we're showing you on the screen right now is the one of the structural tests they do on the wings. Um, this is a Boeing 787 in a structural torture chamber, and uh, they bend the wings up and down for um, two lifetimes of wear, and then they've, they bend the wings up to 150% of their design load after those two lifetimes of wear. They, does, they bend the wings up to 150% of their design load, and they cannot crack. So it's a pretty torturous um, test. So when you are in some turbulence and you see the wing bouncing around, it's that's what it's made to do. It's, ma it's made to be flexible and bend and twist. So don't uh, don't stress too much. Well, it actually, it makes me feel a lot better because in that moment when you're bouncing around, your, your brain obviously tries to tell you that it's serious, but knowing how rare the actual danger is um, does help calm it down. And when you hear that these aircraft are certified for stress loads way beyond anything that the turbulence can throw at them, I mean, we're talking structural testing that goes multiple Gs above anything that we'll ever experience. Um, it does put those bumps into perspective. Yeah. The takeaway here is that while turbulence can absolutely be unpleasant, and I don't like it, uh, and occasionally quite uncomfortable, it remains one of the most well-managed risks in commercial aviation. Turbulence isn't dangerous to the aircraft itself, uh, not these days. It's simply a passenger comfort issue that tech, data sharing and crew training continue to improve on every year. And hey, when all else fails, I'll just go back to my jelly analogy, um, grip that armrest, breathe and remind myself that the plane is not falling. It's just wiggling its way through that moving atmosphere. Um, at cruise, we're glided, gliding through those stable air currents and until they start mixing or shifting, that's when we're getting the bumps. And the mm. plane's just going to ride through it just like it was built to. Yeah. So, viewers, if you, uh, you have experienced some turbulence stories and you want to share them or if you've got questions for a future episode, uh, please let us know. But uh, certainly turbulence is upsetting. There's no doubt about it. And, of course, it's exacerbated by the fact that you can't see what's happening. Quite often it's at night, so you can't see a thing. And uh, it, it can get quite unsettling. But you're not dropping thousands of feet. You're dropping maybe five feet, ten feet. Uh, and a lot of these things are greatly exaggerated as to uh, the actual the actual impact. But uh, Sandy and I are going to be facing turbulence well, mate, hopefully we're not going to be facing hopefully turbulence not. tomorrow <laughs> night. We're off to the Paris Air Show. Um, uh, so Sandy's coming. Uh, uh, our editorial director, Christine Wells, is coming as well. And we're going to be reporting from, from the Paris Air Show. So uh, we'll have a couple of episodes of Winging It with Sandy from the Air Show, bringing you up to date with some of the latest trends and uh, and the vibe of the industry. So um That'll be a lot of fun. So thank you for watching. Um, do like us. Do subscribe to us. Please, as I mentioned, share some stories with us. If you've got anything that you'd like to know about uh, airlines and aviation, just drop us a note at the, at the bottom of this video in the comments. And uh, we look forward to talking to you um, next week from the Paris Air Show. Thank you, Sandy. Thank you again for having me. And yeah, looking forward to hearing some of these turbulent stories and um, and um, hopefully being able to report from the Paris Air Show that we had a lovely smooth flight all the way there with no turbulence. Cross your fingers for us. Yeah.